um, this morning, my um, few of my third through fifth grade class are going to come up, and they've been working hard on learning the books of the Bible. And so four of them know all 66 books in order from memory. Come on up. Will, Eli, Sadie, and Brady in the back. He's like hoping I wouldn't see him. They're super nervous, but I tell them not to be nervous because I have people out here who cannot do this. So <laughs> um, they give me a hard time because I cannot do it. So, <laughs> so they're going to stay, in, they're going to take turns. They work hard, they practice in class. Um, so they're going to go through each book, all of them in order. So bear, bear with them. And they've earned a trip to Pigeon Forge if they do this today. So <laughs> this is their robbery.
by sharing the Ephesians of the Bible, Colossians, Thessalonians 1 and 2, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter and John, 1, 2, 3, and don't forget to Revelations. question, why waste our time doing a children's Bible school? And I can already tell that some of you are angered by, at me by asking the question, which is good. I want you to be angry. I think we need a little more fire in us um, than what we have. And so it actually, the question kind of angers me a little bit as well. And that's why I want to raise it. Why waste our time doing a children's Bible school? You know, it, it certainly begs the question, is it a waste of time? Is it a waste of resources? You know, we've spent thousands of dollars already. Um, you figure hundreds of hours, actually pretty much every night. We've got, I'd say approximately 40 volunteers that's two and a half hours long. That's 100 hours every night. And of course, we're not just showing up, you know, right at six o'clock and leaving right at 8.30 and all the planning, all the decoration, everything goes into it. We're well over a thousand hours. We're gonna spend, this little church here, we're gonna spend over a thousand man hours on a vacation Bible school. Thousands of dollars. The point I'm making is it's a big investment. We need to ask the question, is it a waste of time? Is it just, is it just another form of entertainment for kids? Is it just, you know, it kind of amazes me. I think we've, got, we've had a good turnout, probably uh, around 60. What, how many kids have we had, uh, Bridget? She's already crying. She's so mad at me for asking the question. I'm just kidding. Um, around 60 kids, so I mean, I'm surprised we don't have a thousand kids. It's, it's two and a half hours of free babysitting in the evenings. I mean, I, I'm surprised more don't come, but, but is that all that it is? Is it two and a half hours of free babysitting? Is it just another form of entertainment? It's a big investment for, for approximately 60 children. So I want to raise a question this morning, and this is going to be a pretty brief message. I know everyone's very tired from a busy week. We have another busy week ahead, but I want to raise the question, is it a waste of time? And my answer to this question, you know, you may say, well, Jordan, of course you're going to say, no, it's not a waste of time. But my answer to this question is the same answer I give to every question I get asked of any significance, and it's this, it depends. It depends. It could be a colossal waste of time. It could be. And I fully recognize that. Is it a waste of time? Is it a waste of resources? It depends. What you're going to find out, and this is unavoidable, I don't care what a person's background is, their, their religious background, their cultural background, I don't care about any of that. It all comes down to this, about life, that we have a couple of huge decisions to make in life. Just a handful of huge, I could actually just reduce it down to one huge decision that will then determine every other decision that we make. That's the way life is, and it's completely unavoidable. We all have a couple of huge decisions to make in life, which will then impact and affect all other decisions. If I could pick one, the one major huge question is this, is there a God? Is there a God? And if so, what is he or she or it like? What's required of us? You think about these questions, I like these categories of origin. Where does it, where does it come from? Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Those are the big categories of life. If we ask the question about what, what, what is our life about? Why does life exist? Origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Is there a God? So I want to say this, if atheism is true, our vacation Bible school is a colossal waste of time. But in fact, it's worse than that. We went over this psalm last week going through 1 Corinthians, and the Bible itself says this. It's worse than a waste of time because you understand that we're lying to kids. That we're putting out the banners, we're sending out the message, we're posting things on Facebook to draw kids in. And if atheism is true, do you understand our the entire basis for the content of our vacation Bible school is a lie. We're bringing children in and we're lying to children. 
We're deceiving them. You could even use the term brainwashing. That's what happens when you teach children false ideas. We refer to that as brainwashing children. We are brainwashing children about a God who does not exist. In fact, I wouldn't just say that a children's Bible school is a waste of time. It's actually immoral. It's immoral what we're doing. Now, as I say that, you're probably appalled to be saying that, but do you understand that there, are, there are, are people that I know personally who view Vacation Bible School that way, who view children's church that way, children's ministry that way, that it's immoral, that we are teaching children false ideas, that we are brainwashing children. Are they right? Well, it depends. But you know, what is often missed is this. It's a two-way street. Because if Christianity is true, then atheism is immoral. Then, anything, then, then teaching children an atheist worldview is immoral. You are lying to children. You're deceiving children. You are brainwashing children and teaching them that there is no God when in fact there is a God. One way or the other, one of these two activities or both are immoral and are false. And so as we think about that, I, I use atheism, I could use a lot of other things. When I say, you know, God, is there a God and, and, and what is he, she, or it like? Well, you know, there's atheism which says there is no God. Then there's Christianity, we say that there is a God. But you see, you have Islam that would say, yeah, there is a God, but he's vastly different from what Christianity says. Christianity misrepresents him. So to a, a, a Muslim person, according to Islam, our vacation Bible school is also immoral because we're, we're teaching about God, but we're teaching false things about Him. Same thing is true for Hinduism or Buddhism, the major worldviews. But I've chosen atheism. You could also, you know, maybe lump this together with agnosticism. That if atheism, or excuse me, excuse me, if Christianity is true, atheism or agnosticism is immoral. It is lying and brainwashing children, deceiving them to believe that there is no God when in fact there is a God. So we come to this point this morning and asking this question, why waste our time doing a children's Bible school? Is it a waste of time? Well, the atheist would say yes. The Christian would say no. Stalemate. An atheist opinion versus my Christian opinion. Both equally valid. It is not a stalemate. Yes, there are many different opinions, but it is not a stalemate. Atheism fails miserably on ten different levels and is demonstrably false and to be rejected. It is not equal with Christianity. That's a lie. It is not a stalemate. Atheism, do I, do I say that because I wasn't raised in an atheist home? Atheism is demonstrably false, which means I can demonstrate to you that it is false. It is a false idea to be rejected, and to teach it is to be deceptive. Atheism contradicts reality and cannot account for any aspect of reality. It cannot account for the origin of existence, of the material universe, time, space, and matter, of life, or of consciousness. Atheism, I want to be specific when I say, I don't just say, well, I reject atheism, it's not true. I want to tell you why it's not true. It cannot account for the origin of existence, the origin of the natural universe, origin of life, or origin of consciousness. It also cannot account for the complexity of existence, the natural universe, life, and consciousness. It cannot account for the origin nor the complexity of reality. Atheism cannot explain a single thing in this room right now, but we treat it as if it's equally valid. It is not. I reject it because it should be rejected. I reject it on the basis of fact, not my opinion. Demonstrable facts. 
Atheism cannot explain anything in this room happening right now. It cannot account for us sitting here. The fact is, there is a God, and Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is a factual statement. That I'm not asking you to take my word for it. I'll defend it against anyone at any time. And I'm not a brilliant person. I'm not a highly intelligent person. But I'm telling you the facts bear it out. It's true. It is true. And it needs to be spread everywhere. Because it's true. Not because it's my opinion. But because it is true. We are telling children the truth. And they're not getting it anywhere else. Do you understand that? In fact, they're not just not getting the truth. They're getting lies in other places. Do you understand? You have to make it, you're going to have to make up your mind. We want to be so pluralistic and so open-minded. I'll promise you that's false. You're going to have to make up your mind on what is true. There's a, there's a secular song, and I like the line in this song. It is so, it, it's so rare to get this from our culture, but it, it makes this statement. It says, decide what to be and go be it. Do something. Is it true or is it not? We're saying Christianity is true. And I'm going to teach it to children because it's true. If you think it's false, I beg you, come show me where the falsehood is. Come show me where it is refutable. And I'll stop doing Bible school and I'll stop doing a lot of other things. I'm teaching Christianity. We're, we're bringing children in because it is true that there is a God and Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that fact should change every afternoon of your life. Not just two weeks. 52 weeks. That fact that there is a God and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that fact should change every afternoon of your life and every morning, every day, every decision. And if it doesn't, you don't get it. These kids may come in and get it, but I mean, assure, assure you something. It is, if it doesn't transform every aspect of your life, you don't get it. I don't care what you claim. You don't understand the reality and the fact that there is a God and Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Once you understand that, it changes everything in your life. The point I'm making this morning is this. It's not just what we do. It is why we do what we do. It is the basis, it is the reason, it is the foundation. As we stand this morning and read, I kind of skipped over this part, but uh, I'm too fired up by the question. Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37. Listen to what this says. It says, in, referring to Christ, it says, And he came to Capernaum. And being in, in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed amongst them, among themselves who should be the greatest. Again, this ties in everything I'm saying. That greatest by what standard? Which direction is greatness? Is it that way? Someone else says it's that way. Well, which one is it? Is it that way? Is it that way? Who determines what greatness, what greatness is? By what standard? On what basis? You notice they're already ashamed to answer the question, what were you disputing about? Because they, they recognize that it's wrong to be prideful, to be self-promoting, which is what they're doing. Verse 35, And he sat down and called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child... And set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them. So this isn't, this isn't a 14-year-old. This is a child that Jesus can pick up. A small child. He said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one, one of such children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word, for your revelation. God, we so desperately need it. And it's not just, not just me, it's not just us, it's everyone. God, we need your revelation, we need your light.
God, without you, it is complete blindness and darkness. It is complete error. Without your revelation and your truth, the facts, the details, the content, that, God, we could never figure out on our own. We will not find this truth in a microscope or in a telescope. It has to be revealed supernaturally by you. It has to come through divine revelation, and that's exactly what we have. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Will we believe it? Will we apply it? Or will we reject it and ignore it? God, I pray that you would give us receptive hearts here this morning, God. Speak to each one of us here this morning, God, and help us, God, to no longer be wishy-washy, riding the fence. God, I'm so tired of riding the fence. God, help us to make up our mind and make a decision. Are we going to believe it or not? And then go live that out. And God, show us that we have absolutely every reason to trust your word and trust your revelation for every decision in our life, for every afternoon in our life, for every morning in our life, for every day. We have every reason to trust you and to trust your word. God, thank you, Father, for this time together. Thank you for our vacation Bible school up to this point. Every child that's come, we pray, God, you continue to bless. God, it's already been a tremendous time. God, we pray that you would continue to bless in the week ahead. We pray and ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. You notice the statements that Jesus is making here. These are statements that we have to do something with. We sang the songs earlier about heaven came down, glory filled my soul. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Do you understand that there's claims in this Bible that you have to make a decision on? I was reading it last week, I guess, in John, and I never noticed before that how explicitly Jesus said this. He said this to a large crowd of people. He said, I came down from heaven. That's what he claimed. I mean, can you imagine a man standing up and saying, I have arrived here from heaven. That's what he said. You can't just walk past that. You have to, you have, when someone makes a claim like that in Jesus, I mean, he does all the work. He's making this enormous claim. You have to say either that is a true statement or that is a, either he came down from heaven or he did not. He claimed to have come down from heaven. Then you look at the other evidence and say, well, does that bear out? Well, when he starts walking on water, you start saying, well, wait a minute, that's a crazy claim, but that's crazy too. When he feeds the 5,000, which is he had just done prior to saying, I came down from heaven, when he feeds the 5,000 with basically a, a little boy's lunch, suddenly that statement becomes powerful, and you have, to, you have to deal with that. In fact, you have to believe that based upon the evidence or reject it contrary to the evidence. That's the kind of thing Jesus does. He does the same thing here. He's making some big statements here. And based on what we were saying earlier, it's not just what we do. It is why we do what we do. The basis, the reason, the foundation. And we find all of that contained in this little phrase in verse 37, in my name. That's a little phrase. That's a loaded statement. In my name. That which you do in my name. What are they doing in his name? Verse 37. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name. That's what gives the significance. Doing what in his name? It is, it is receiving little children. What's the, what's the significance of that? It is receiving the seemingly insignificant, but you're doing that in the name of Jesus. The seemingly insignificant. Just a five-year-old. It's just a five-year-old. It's just a second grader. Just a seventh grader. Not significant. You know, if we were having a meeting this past week of Nobel laureates, living Nobel laureates, suddenly, okay, it's substantial. Seemingly. If they don't know Christ, they're nothing. But we're bringing little children in, seemingly, seemingly insignificant. Just a five-year-old. Just a second grader. Just a seventh grader. They seem insignificant. Christ says, no, 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 they are significant. If you receive them in my name. They seem like they're just a little kid. 
just a young person. But what are they really? Well, let's start here. We have 60 kids. So we're investing thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours, maybe thousands of hours for 60 kids, 60 young people. What are they really? Well, if you take those 60 young people, children, young people, and let's give them an average life expectancy of 60 years, and it's going to be, that's very conservative. But let's give them an average life expectancy of 60 years. We're talking about 3,600 years of life. 60 times 60, 3,600 years of life is walking in and out of these doors in the evenings from 6 to 8.30. Almost 4,000 years, probably, statistically, probably 4,000 years of life sat in these chairs this past week. 4,000 years of human life is represented in that little Bible school that Marble Hill's doing. 4,000 years of life is on the line. But it gets much bigger than that. You bring one of these little kids in. Let's say you bring one of the five-year-olds in. You sit them up here on the table. What are we really talking about? Just a five-year-old? This five-year-old is conscious, can answer questions. The son can't do that. It's a million times larger than the earth. You can fit a million earths in the sun. It powers the entire solar system. But it can't answer my questions, but this little boy can. We can converse. He can learn things. He can pick things up. This little boy, this little girl, they're made in the image of God. As I'm speaking to this child, I am seeing the image of God in front of me. They bear the image of God, and not only that, this is an eternal being. You know, children die. Talked about last week. We finished with that last week. Talked about some pretty heavy things last week. 18-year-olds that were, were the perpetrators of mass shootings. 18-year-olds who were killed themselves. They didn't go out of existence. Children die, but they do not go out of existence. That little child, if they were to die... And I've done funerals for, I've thought a lot about this, doing funerals for a one-year-old baby, 18 months, two years. That, what, what, what did they contribute to life? They didn't do anything. They couldn't, they didn't even know that, they didn't even realize that they were alive. But yet, they bear the image of God every bit as much as you do. Or Elon Musk does. They, they equally bear the image of God. That's who we're talking about, an image bearer of God who is an eternal being. So forget that 4,000 years, that's nothing but dust on the scale compared to 60 eternities. 60 eternities are what are being entrusted to us for two and a half hours every evening this past week and this coming week. That's what we're talking about. And beyond that, again, verse 37. Listen to what this crazy guy says. Whosoever shall receive one such children in my name, they're seemingly insignificant. When you receive them, you receive me. When you receive them, you receive me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying when that kid comes skipping, hopping through the door, that's Jesus Christ hopping through the door. That's God hopping through the door. Is that not what he's saying? If you read something different, you let me know. That's exactly what he's saying. When you receive, they're seemingly insignificant, but I've declared them significant. They bear my image. They're an eternal being. They're my creation. And when you receive them, you receive me. What happens if you reject them? You're rejecting God, the infinite God. Do you understand the implications of this? Do you understand how big this is? No, it's not a waste of time. Why waste our time doing a children's Bible school? We're not. And you're a stupid, blind fool if you think we are. You're a stupid, blind fool if you think that our Bible school is a waste of time. Your eyes will get open one day when... When the king sits upon the throne and says, For as much as you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. And as for as much as you didn't do it unto the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. 
when he look when his burning eyes look upon you you're going to understand then how significant a vacation bible school done in Jesus' name just how significant that is this is big I don't make it big. I don't decide if it's big. The one who said, when you receive that little child, you receive me. He's the one that made it a big deal. He's the one that makes it big. We see here that it is receiving the seemingly insignificant. You know, children were shooed away. We're going to read that in just a moment. They were kind of a nuisance. In their, and it's kind of that way today. You know, they're, they're somebody else's problem. You know, they're, they're, they're just mouths to feed or whatever it might be. They were seen as somewhat of a nuisance. And Jesus said, let me make this very clear. They are not a nuisance to me, which means they better not be a nuisance to you. Seemingly insignificant, but in reality, eternally significant children. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41 Jesus goes on, and John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ. You see that phrase again? In my name. Because you belong to Christ, verily, truly, I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. We were talking about, Jesus just rolled from talking about seemingly insignificant little kids and young people who are in reality are eternally significant. And now he's talking about seemingly insignificant acts. Giving a cup of water. It seems insignificant in my name. It ain't, it ain't, it's no longer insignificant. Children who may seem insignificant, in his, when you receive them in His name, you're receiving Him, you're receiving the Father, you're receiving God. When it's in His name, suddenly it has eternal significance. Giving a cup of water, seemingly insignificant, when you do it in His name, it has eternal significance. Perhaps I should say giving a cup of Kool-Aid purple or red, in his name, is of eternal significance. Making a craft, teaching a song, playing a game, and there it is again, in my name. That's a loaded statement. The name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It's in that name that we do these things. They may seem ins insignificant. They are eternally significant. Last of all, we read, skip over a chapter, kind of in the same context, though, Mark chapter 10. We'll finish up with this, verses 13 through 16. This is where it's even more explicit. It changes everything. It changes my entire view of children. Verse 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And so, I mean, this is the idea is that, you know, kids are just in the way. They're just kind of, you know, a nuisance. You know, you shoo them out of the way. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children, or allow the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily, truly, I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. I hope you see from this passage, this one and the one we just read in Mark chapter 9, that Jesus, the Creator, the Savior of the world, determines the significance. This question, why waste our time doing a children's Bible school? And what do you, what do you deem a waste of time? As if you would know. You don't know anything. You don't know what time is for. Did you create time? Who determines the times and the seasons that God has put into, into, the, into the, in the hands of men? What do, how would you, how would you even, rec you would even recognize a waste of time if you were to see it. It is the creator, it is the savior of the world 
who determines the significance. What is a waste and what is an investment? A wise investment. He determines the significance and he also supplies the significance. When it's done in obedience to him, when it's done in his infinite name, that's what makes it significant. And you can't do something in, in Jesus' name in disobedience to him. It has to be in obedience to him. What, what he taught us, what he showed us, you see it in this passage, modeling this for us, teaching us this as the perfect example. When it's done in obedience to him, and when it's done in his infinite name, he supplies the significance. He's the one that makes it significant. If it's done in his name, it's significant. If it's, if it's not done in his name, it's worthless. And time will bear that out. The point I'm getting at is this. It's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about him compared to whom we are all just like little children. Totally dependent on Him. Utterly helpless without Him. Do you understand? That's where Christ tells them later on, the disciples. John 15, talk about the bottom of the branch. He says, without me, you can do nothing. And that's the truth. I'm like a, I'm like a little child, but I'm even more dependent you know, you look around, you think about the smallest child in our church, you know, at, at least that child is independent upon you or their parents for oxygen. But I mean, pretty much 99% of what they have, they're dependent upon somebody else. We're even more dependent than that. We are utterly dependent upon Christ. The, the most brilliant theologian to ever live, the Apostle Paul, was utterly dependent upon Christ like a little bitty child. Our wisdom that we, that we think so much of, our human wisdom, in comparison to God's infinite wisdom, is like an infant. It is infantile, or less than infantile, compared to the infinite wisdom of Christ. It's all about Him, compared to whom we are all just like little children, totally dependent on Him, and utterly helpless without Him. That's what salvation is. It's when you recognize, I am... What are you going to do to save yourself from hell? The answer is you're going to do nothing. You cannot do anything to save yourself. The only thing you could possibly do is it maybe even make it worse through trying to purchase God's favor through good works or through self-righteousness. The fact is you cannot do anything to save yourself eternally. We are 100% dependent upon Christ. That's why he says... That if you don't receive the kingdom of God as a little child, which is a gift that you did nothing to deserve, you just receive it. If you don't receive it as a little child, you shall not enter therein. We have to see our, not, not, not some dependence upon Christ, but complete and total dependence upon Christ. Recognizing our utter helplessness without Him. Do you see how big this is? And do you see how this applies to our children's Bible school and to literally everything else? This applies to everything. Everything we do every afternoon, every morning, every day, every decision, is it Christ-centered? Can we truly say that we're doing this in His name, in trusting Him? You know, we trust Him in what we're doing. We trust Him in our obedience. We're also trusting Him for the results. Because if you were to say to me, well, Jordan, let's say a kid comes every night. Maybe you get 20 hours. Maybe around 20 hours with one of these children. We talked about it last week. Do you know the world? Do you remember from last week the world we're living in? A violent, sexually perverted world. I mean, that's the world we live in. That's the world that these kids live in every second of every day. You think 20 hours, maybe, maybe all told, maybe, maybe a couple of hours of lessons is going to change that? Without Christ, <laughs> you're going to tell me. Without Christ, it's a joke. It's a, it is a waste of time. I mean, this is, a, this is an avalanche of, of violence and sexual perversion and, and, and error coming at them. What do you think this is going to do? 
But that's why we're also trusting Him for the results. Here's what I think is going to happen. A miracle is going to happen. I can't do a miracle. You can't do a miracle. None of our teachers can do miracles. But when Christ, when the Spirit of Christ shows up, because you see, there is a God and Jesus Christ is His Son, and the Father and the Son sent the Spirit into this world, the Spirit of Christ, who is also attending our Bible school, who is also here right now, I think He can work a miracle. And when He works a miracle in the heart of a child, it's amazing how that can turn the tide and this avalanche gets stopped and can be reversed off of this child, but only through the supernatural, infinite power of Christ, not through anything we can do. We trust Him for, I'm utterly dependent upon Christ for the results of our Bible school. And so are you as teachers. And so are you as parents. And so are you as grandparents. You can't do it. It'll take Christ to do it in their heart, to work a miracle in their heart. We are trusting Him for everything, including the results of this past week and this coming week. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask um, our singers and musicians to come. I ask everybody to stand if you would. Like I said, I know it's been a busy week. I know everybody's tired. Um, so we're going to keep it short this morning. I want to say this as we close. And this ties in, I mean, this again, we're talking about the specific question of a children's Bible school, a vacation Bible school, but this applies to everything. It applies to all of life. Is it Christ-centered? Is it done in His name or is it not? And a big part of what fires me up this morning is this, is that I'm sick of nominal Christianity. I am sick of nominal Christianity. I've been sick of nominal Christianity. I'll describe it this way. What do I mean by nominal Christianity? That's kind of a weird term. Maybe you don't use that all the time. What do I mean by that? I mean, I mean people for whom Jesus is sort of the Son of God. Is Jesus the Son of God? Sort of. That's the stupidest answer you could give. He's sort of it. Well, he is on, um, he is three days a week, but the other four days a week he's not. Now, yeah, it sounds absurd, but that's how we live. Jesus is Lord on Monday, but I was tired on Tuesday, so he wasn't Lord on Tuesday. When I say nominal Christianity, I mean people for whom Jesus is sort of the Son of God. I heard someone say this week, someone asked him to, to define, what do you mean by a nominal Christian? This is a Southern Baptist pastor. And he's kind of said like, he, he was asked a question about his, is your church mostly nominal Christians? In the Southern, in the Southern Baptist Church, he said, it's kind of like this. He said, if you meet somebody who, in 2022, if you meet someone who is Jewish, you can assume that they're actually an atheist. Because about 95% of Jewish people are actually atheists. They go through the cultural, they may observe Passover, they go through different, um, they're, they're Jewish culturally. But in reality, they don't believe that there's a God. They're actually atheists. And, and it's so predominant amongst Jewish people living in 2022 that if you meet someone who's Jewish, you can just assume that they're an atheist and they don't believe that there's a God. Well, he said when it comes to a Southern Baptist church, a Southern Baptist church member, you can assume they're nominal. That's how prevalent it is. You can assume that they are sort of committed, somewhat committed. Not totally uncommitted, but certainly not totally committed. Nominal. Again, this is a Southern Baptist church pastor. And I think he's exactly right. I don't think he's being mean. I don't think he's being dismissive or belittling. I think he's telling the truth. 13 million Southern Baptists in America. 50,000 churches. But there's not much impact. You know why? Because you can assume if you meet a Southern Baptist, they're nominal. I'm sick of nominal, not nominal Southern Baptist life. I'm sick of nominal Christianity. Sort of committed. Jesus is sort of the Son of God. Somewhat committed. 
I want to say this this morning. That stupidity is how you waste your life. The Bible school is not a waste of our time. That's a waste of your time. That stupidity is how you waste your time. That stupidity is how you waste your resources. And that stupidity is how you waste your life. Is that you? Then change. Change. Period. <laughs> change. Because your life makes no sense. And it better start making sense because the time is ticking and you're wasting it. No, we're not wasting our time. We're not wasting our time this past week. We're not wasting our time this morning. And I fully intend to continue to not waste my time or my life. I've wasted plenty of my own time living a halfway life, half in, half out, living a double life. And at some point, even as a teenager, I said, this is absurd. Jesus is not sort of the Son of God. He's not the Son of God at church on Sunday morning and not the Son of God on Monday morning at school when I'm perverted and vulgar, just like everybody else. Something has to give. I'm not just sick of it for you. I'm sick of it for me, too. I want to be totally committed because that's the only thing that makes sense. It is the only thing that makes sense. Anything else is a waste. Anything else is insufficient. As we sing this morning, what page do you have, Bill? 407. Page 407. Because he lives. Because he lives. Page 407. And I want you to know something. Love it, hate it, reject it, accept it. He lives. He lives. He came down from heaven. He died on the cross. He gave his life for me. He gave his life for you. He didn't just die because, they, because the authorities caught up with him. He died for you to save you. He died for me to save me. But he rose again on the third day and he lives today. 2,000 years later, he lives. Because he lives, it changes everything. As we sing this together, if you need to come and pray, this altar is open. You need to pray there at your seat. Pray there at your seat. But I would encourage you to get things right between you and Christ, between you and him. He's told us the truth. He's revealed the truth to us. What are we going to do with it? Does your life make sense? Does your, do your decisions make sense? Are they consistent? Or are they inconsistent? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself this morning as we sing.